whom we are so familiar with. Sarah it was a professor at Luther Seminary and would come and share all her great knowledge and wisdom with us in so many classes. Then we were privileged to have her as an uh, adult minister for a year or so in her first retirement, and then in several retirements after that. She's been serving as an interim minister and is presently at a congregation in White Bear Lake. And she's so graciously accepted to come and be with us today because among her many degrees, Sarah also has a Master of Art History degree from St. Thomas and is presently a docent at the Minneapolis Art Institute. So we are going to be the recipients of her great insight and most importantly, she told me she loved the book. So that's where we had to start. So I'll let you hear from Sarah, who has so many um, wonderful observations and insights and connections to this. So Sarah Henry. All right, so we're finagling a, a computer and a lot of notes up here, because I have a lot of stuff, and if I don't have notes, I'll just talk to death about one thing and never get anywhere else. I, uh, I want you to know this, because it's how much I really enjoy being here and how much I really care about you all. This is a vacation day. I took a vacation Sunday from my church in order to come here and talk about this, and I'm so happy to be here. So. So you are my vacation. <laughs> I don't quite know how we're going to do this. And the reason is, for those of you who have read the book, and that will be quite a few of you, I'm sure, uh, this is an oversized assignment. Um, and I thought so. You know, Geraldine Brooks took however many years, maybe three, four, to kind of research quite different periods in American history, right? We have pre-Civil War, the antebellum, we have the Civil War and some things that come after, although she doesn't go deeply into that. And then she veers into the art scene in New York around the time of Jackson Pollock. And then there's the present with an art history graduate student, and she weaves them together. And I tried to pull them apart so that we could look at art that would actually show us some of the connections here. And wow, did I end up with a gigantic amount of stuff. So I had to make a plan. And here's the plan. And I'm going to read it because otherwise, again, I won't keep it. First of all, and this is all important, and there will be historical questions as well as economic and cultural ones that come to mind for you. Just raise your hand. Matt says he'll bring a microphone, but I'll bet you you know, if we just talk amongst ourselves, and you can send typed questions to us as well if you're watching online, we can just interrupt and answer because this plan will take us at least to the end of the hour. I actually think I'll have to come back at least two or three times. Yeah. All right, there is almost no surviving African-American self-representation from before the Civil War. And you can think of all kinds of reasons for that, and they'd all be right. I'm going to show you white American representation of African Americans with just a little nod at the beginning to some of the European roots. And I mean a little nod, because in fact, when Americans first started representing the Africans among them, and they weren't African-American at that point, they were African, they were still colonists from Europe. So those European roots, and then a lot of European training, were really, really important in the way that artists showed black Africans. So we'll do that fairly quickly, and I'm going to put a little subset of pictures in there that ordinarily I would have ignored that are the equestrian paintings that were the subject of so much in the book and are really very interesting. 
a, a whole study in its own right, as our graduate student in the book found out. Then we're going to look at African American self-representation around and after the Civil War, especially looking toward one major milestone for African American self-representation, and that was the Paris Exposition in 1890. And you'll see why that gets important. Now you can hear us moving past the Civil War. That Reconstruction period is really a tough one, and that'll be the third section. We'll be looking at the way white folk represented African Americans in the Reconstruction, and I'm going to say so-called Reconstruction period, uh, when the strictures were off African Americans legally. We had the Emancipation Proclamation, et cetera. But how to keep them down on the farm, how to, how to keep control, and it, the way art was used to cast African Americans as people needing to be controlled and appreciating it. And those of you who have ever studied women's history can hear echoes of the way women have been portrayed over the years as well. And finally, if there's time, and I'm not promising, I have a few examples of more contemporary Harlem Renaissance, 1910, 1930, on of African American self-representation again, where African Americans, now I'm gonna be sweepingly general, so I hope you'll forgive me, but it, I gotta. African Americans begin to see that reason alone isn't gonna change the way they are perceived in the country. And so they take on the stereotypes that have been the representation by white artists of them and try to subvert the stereotypes artistically. So you will see that we're gonna go to the past to understand the present, but we've got a lot to cover. And for African Americans, and I'm just gonna use that term even for colonial, before there was an America, or a United States of America. Life was really lived on the defensive. Even if um, you understand defensive or apology, not in the sense of rueful cringing, but always being aware that you might have to give an accounting of yourself, or your appearance, or your deeds, or your smell, or your food. There was always a sense that that otherness of black African people and brown African people and people who'd come up through Cuba or Haiti, the slave trade was a massive net that captured all kinds of folks, was part of your life. And we know that, still is, right? Over the past couple of years, you've all heard people talk about having the talk with their children before they get old enough to drive, for sure, and long before that in many cases, so that they know how to behave as folks who are seen differently. And the interesting thing here is that race is so visual. It's, and that makes the visual representation of it really important. There are other things that happen too. Now this is from the 14th century. So I'm gonna go back to those European roots and I'm gonna go pretty fast. Don't even ask me any questions about these. I'm not gonna answer. <laughs> but this is a Franco-Flemish master. Nobody knows quite who painted it, but they know from where he came. So somewhere in North Europe. And North Europe uh, was very interesting in regard to painting African Americans in positions of subjection. And you can see quite easily that this very small person over on the far right is in fact an African. And you can see a number of things about him that show you that the artist is not positioning him on the same human level 
never mind socioeconomic, the same human level as these other characters, the crouch, the fact that his legs are bare and everybody else is pretty covered up. Now, this king does have a midi-type robe rather than a full-length one, the one to the right, but his legs, the African's legs are bare way up to the... It's, it's a sign of um, not being quite fully human, not clothed. This will come up again in a really interesting statue that's done in 1870 after the Civil War. That's the Emancipation statue that I think may have been moved in these latter years. But unclothed is a sign of closer to nature, closer to an animal life. And his job is either to hand that particular gold piece to the king or to help support it. We don't know. His small size is also indicative of his lack of importance. Remember, the painters at this point are not doing much in line of perspective. So how do they show who is and who is not important? And size is one of the ways that they do that. Granted, the Christ child is not big, but he is a baby. And notice how big his head is. The African head dwindles in comparison. So you can see that this is, in fact, a servant, and that this painter from, let's say, southern France or Belgium would have been accustomed to thinking about the possibility of such servitude. This is a much later, well, it's not much later. This is from uh, Montaigne. And again, this is the Adoration of the Magi, which is a place that blacks could safely be brought in. And you see the guy on the far right again, not small, and this time a king. This is an Italian. So Southern Europe is already beginning to see this 8th century and then 14th century uh, creation of one of the kings as African to present three continents, Africa, Asia, and Europe, or three ages of man, or you know, all sorts of ways of counting three, which doesn't even appear in scripture anyway, but never mind. What's interesting about this king is both his jewelry and the uh, kind of exaggeration of his features. The large lips that are really red, and a lot of the white of his eye shows on both eyes. So kind of exotic. And exotic is safe as long as it doesn't intrude too much, right? As long as you're just looking at it. This is a Dutch family, and it is 16th century. And I, I don't know if you can even spot it right away, but way back here, and down here, and I'll zoom it in a minute, there is an African-American in charge of the horse. Or, I'm sorry, there's an African in charge of this horse. He's African and Dutch. And he, again, is very small. Now, that could be a matter of perspective in this particular painting. Um, and he's much lower down than everybody else. Here's a hill of some sort on which the stalwart white guy in the family stands. And way down below is that black young person, he looks young anyway, who's in charge of the horse. This is not an atypical kind of scene. And it's really interesting because of, I didn't really know this for, for many, many years, but the Dutch and the English who together uh, settle, maybe sequentially, settle New York and the American colonies both had a tradition of Africans helping to care for their horses. They also both had traditions of including horses in paintings of families because, of course, I mean, it'd be like being painted in your vintage Corvette, right? It's a, it's a sign that you have some extra cash and you can put it into some sort of acquisition like a horse. And this, let me bring him up. There he is with the horse managing him in a kind of gentle way and looking very closely at the horse. He doesn't even look up the way the family does. He doesn't look at any family members. He's just there for the horses. And that 
Dutch sensibility, which is also English, comes right into the American colonies in New York City. So I'm going to just back off here for a minute and read you a statistic. 20% of colonial New Yorkers were enslaved Africans. So before the Revolutionary War, 20% of the people who lived in what's now New York City were enslaved Africans, first the Dutch and then the English. And you can sort of imagine why that would be true. Both the Dutch and the English had massive navies and large transoceanic trade going on. And that included the kinds of things that slaves produced, sugar and tobacco and coffee and finally cotton, but it also then included the slaves themselves. And a note that I read said that New York ship captains and merchants bought and sold slaves along the coast of Africa and in the taverns of their own city. George Washington, who of course was in New York quite a bit, was also, as you know, the owner of many slaves. In fact, there was just a new book reviewed. Darn, I can't remember absolutely anything about it except the page it was on in the newspaper that uh, really looked at the founding fathers and their slaveholding and their proclamations of the necessity of freedom and liberty. And the, and the fact that those two didn't feel contradictory to them. This is really important because it's clear, and it was in the designing of the Constitution as well, that African Americans, Africans living in America, not quite American, were not quite on the level of human beings. So let's, we need to keep that in mind. Washington talked about <clears throat> saying that if we, white people, presumably, submitted to British tyranny, we would be as tame and abject slaves as the blacks we rule over. So that's who you don't want to be. All right, let me move on here with a couple other things. Well, let's go. I have a lot of information about the United States that I'm just going to walk over. And I'm not getting into the biblical grounding of the understanding of black people as um, a little less than human or in desperate need of being controlled. That same kind of biblical stuff was used also about women, as you know. But here is where it begins to depart. In the 18th century especially, and in the 19th, Europe and America, Northern Europe and America, both begin to take an interest in the scientific way of supporting a dehumanization or a lesser humanization of African Americans. This is a model from a guy named Petrus Kemper, and you can see where he's going. This is the natural differentiation of features and persons of different countries. And he didn't say races at this point, but we start with a monkey on the far left, and it's a very small skull. And you can see it moves toward a more chimpanzee-like. There's more of a forehead that gets built up here into African Americans. And as we evolve, we evolve toward a Caucasian straight line face. So who's closer to the monkeys here? It doesn't leave much to the imagination. Now, Keep in mind that not everybody would see this, but it was printed. It's part of a book that would have been shared broadly as people tried to sort out who were these others who looked so different. And then we get the profile of Negro European, and that is orangutan. This is uh, also from Camper. And again, you see the contrast that he wants to show, taking a Greek head from a, an ancient Greek statue as a model for the Caucasian race, he 
shows you how different that angle is as a fancy name for an African American, a Negro, and then how that looks on an orangutan, who do doesn't seem to be at all human. So again, illustrating a variety of things. This is a whole part of an interest in the shape of your head saying something about the essence of who you are. So by 1839, and I have one more to show you, there are lectures. This is all now discounted. I mean, nobody thinks that the shape of your head, the phrenology, the bumps and the crannies and all that indicates the essence of who you are. And that's the big deal. The shape of your head does not tell us what your morality is, what your intelligence is, what you're capable of. But it was understood in the 18th and 19th century and into the 20th that it did. The closeness to an orangutan is a lack of evolvedness. And that means that you can't be trusted to have the morals of a fully human person. This is a French guy, Comte de Leclerc, uh, Comte de, de Buffon. And again, it's the measurement. Some of you know from your reading, thank God not from your experience, that this is what happened with Jews in Germany. The scientists hung around in the university and developed measurements and came up with the pseudoscience of determining that Jews were immoral, et cetera, et cetera, from the shape of their faces and the shapes of their heads. And then it's but a step to saying inhuman. And we've got to say grades of intelligence. This time our intelligent guy is on the far left and on the far right is a man who's at the other end of the spectrum. You don't want to be at the other end of the spectrum on intelligence. Nonetheless, people began to be fascinated by Africans. And think about France. Now, this is a, a piece, a bust by a guy named Cordier. And Cordier was a French sculptor. France is now into North Africa, and colonists are coming from North Africa to France, there's more shipping, more trade. People are seeing in their own cities folk who don't look like them. And there's still a sense of the exotic about this. Again, what do you do with exotic animals? But we'll just say that Cordier actually gives him that same facial shape, but a kind of at least quiet dignity. This will change after the Civil War. And both of these are by Cordier. He, he made a big career for himself. We have a piece down at Mia, by the way, by him. And uh, it's not bronze, it's stone. But you see that he very carefully shapes the forehead on both the woman and the man, even though he gives them, again, a kind of a dignity. But it was not received very well as dignity. And here is a cartoon reaction to Cordier's exhibit, Monsieur Cordier and the proper subjects of sculpture, the fountains, the tall person who's done something wonderful somewhere. And then somebody that looks almost more like Aunt Jemima, right? With the, look at the grin, that wildly undignified wildly different, sloppy, really, looking clothing and body. And Monsieur Cordier in sculpture brings the black among all the whites at the exposition and compares it to music. So the French aren't having it. Maybe a few of them are going to buy those gorgeous statues that have a little dignity. But by and large, when a Frenchman or a Frenchwoman sees black, that's the way they look. All that said, there were a few revolutionary and pre-revolutionary pictures. And actually, you know, I forgot to ask. There should be a sheet with my slides on it that Michael was going to print out that we can share. So it's somewhere. Okay. 
Thank you. Just so you know, you don't have to worry about finding these. You can just look on the sheet and see what they are. This is a painting by Gilbert Stuart, who painted the Washingtons that we are most familiar with. This is from 1795, so well after the Revolutionary War and even the Constitutional. This is George Washington's cook. We don't get his name. How's that? No name. But we know what he did. And again, he is conveying him with some degree of dignity. There were folk who believed, and not infrequently, that black Africans could fill a role with some appropriate dignity. They couldn't fill many roles. They didn't have much agency. But to be a cook, you could do and hold your head up, literally. I mean, he looks marvelous in all his white clothing, right? But uh, I, I have no idea why he was painted, why Washington wanted to have his cook painted. But as you remember from the book Horse, there were, was affectionate relationship, or at least slightly respectful relationships between some masters and some slaves, or some masters and some freedmen. He was a slave. So that it's possible that he wanted to honor him in some way. And there he is, one of very few post-Civil War paintings, also by a white man. This is by a white woman. This is a woman named Susan, or by a woman named Susan Sedgwick, and her name, this woman's name is Elizabeth Freeman, 1811. Susan was a housewife um, of means. And one of the things she did in her life was paint. She was not all bad. And this is a miniature painting of a slave in her household. I don't know, if, again, if it was affection or she wondered if she could render the skin tones, whatever it was. But she paints her in, an, again, that kind of dignified way. This is a side, but uh, not totally irrelevant. At Luther Seminary, there is a very old Norwegian chapel on the grounds that was moved up there from Norway many, many years ago. And I, at one point, got to go in there. I think there was a wedding, and uh, I got to go inside. And the, the gallery was ringed with portraits of people who looked so crabby. I couldn't believe it. Why would anybody pay to have a portrait made and then approve? I mean, an artist can go back and paint a, you know, a little uptick to the mouth instead of a little downturn with a couple strokes. It's not that hard. But no, these were the portraits that were painted and paid for and approved by their subjects or the family of the subject. Well, it was a style. It was a way of presenting yourself to the world as a responsible human being. You didn't grin like that caricature that we saw of Cordier's sculpture. So you can tell you a tiny bit of a smile going here, but not much. Her mouth is firmly closed. That's positive. She's not seen as an orangutan. And this one, this is really one of the few that I located. This is a painting. We don't quite know when it was painted, but we know by whom, and we know his lifespan. A guy named Joshua Johnson, who was himself African American, painted this portrait of an African American man, again, no name, somewhere between 1763, when he was born. So let's give him 20 years. 1783 and 1826 when he died. Joshua Johnson was very active in Baltimore. And Baltimore and Philadelphia both had fairly large African-American populations of both slaves who came there to work on behalf of the master. Port cities, right? Houses of... Uh, accounting warehouses for products so that you could send your slave to those southern, almost southern, cities and have them employed. Also, both of those places, and particularly Philly, of all things, was uh, a city where slaves could be sent to learn furniture making. 
They could be apprenticed to either freemen or white people and still as slaves live in those cities learning a trade that would be of value back on the plantation. And so there were more substantial populations of African Americans by now in those, those two cities from one of which Joshua Johnson emerges as a painter and he paints white people mostly but we have this one painting of a guy who is not identified. He must have had a little money. All right, so here's your Presbyterian for the day. This is a guy named Troy, Edward Troy. He was born in Switzerland, trained in England. So keeping that in mind, he brings that English sensibility about equestrian painting to the United States. He was born in 1808, lived till 1874, so right through the Civil War period. And he moved to the West Indies and spent a couple years on a sugar plantation, and then he settled in Philadelphia, where he became part of the Artist Society, and he began painting horses in 1832. So he was quite young when he got into this equestrian stuff, and I'm going to this is a self-portrait by Troy. And you can see we've got the typical thing. Now we're getting to this equestrian subset because this is what the book is kind of about. And it's painting that the lady throws out. And I probably would too. I didn't care about horses. But what did I know about racing being the sport of kings and thus adopted early? in the American South. The American South was less urbanized than the North, more agricultural, bigger parcels of land, more horses, and a sense that those who owned plantations or very, very large farms were in fact an elite. And they sort of continued to imitate the style of the English elite from which they took their descent, at least so they claimed. But you can see how easily that, that sort of landed English gentry became the model for the landed southern gentry in a way it never did in the north. Not to say it was good or bad, but it certainly did shape the course of things. So this landed gentry wanted records of they're wonderful horses. And these are not totally unlike marriage portraits that we have tons of from Europe. When there was no photograph, you had your portrait painted and sent around to prospective spouses. Uh, sort of an early, you know, never mind. <laughs> I was thinking of digital sites for dating, but uh, I think they were a little more selective about to whom the portrait would go. And you didn't have your portrait painted casually. I mean, it cost money to have your portrait painted well. And so there weren't duplicates all over the place. But now we have the horses being painted for much the same reason. Somebody can look at it. Somebody with an eye, like the Africans that we met in the book, is able to sort of judge size, figure out shape, is this likely to be a fast horse or a slow horse? And portraying oneself in a carriage with a horse is not that different from the Dutch family making sure their horse got in the picture. You've got, you've got a little social clout if you have both a carriage and a horse. And you will see that in a 1900 photo from W.E.B. Du Bois. Jill, how are we doing for time? Me too. There's no clock in here, which is 914? 49? Yeah. All right. Well, we're going to go through these equestrians pretty quick. So any questions while I pop to another horse? Good. <laughs> you can always send them to me if you have to. I'm not hard to find. Okay, so this is Troy again. Now, I, I don't have stuff from Scott. I didn't... We have Scott's picture of uh, Lexington, but he's not as interesting, quite honestly. So here's Troy now showing 
the jockey who is, I think, white. But this guy is not, and this guy certainly is not. But I want you to notice how he's dressed. In that scene in the book, when Derek comes back, that ability to get dressed in the highest fashion of the time, the most formal appearance, adds to his own sense of dignity. W.E.B. Du Bois has a word about double consciousness, that for African and African-American folk, you always perceive yourself as others perceive you. And the others are the whites, of course, who, who then are setting a standard for your own self-perception. I had a, a colleague way back in the day at Chicago when I was teaching there, and he was himself black, and he used to say, the worst thing you can say to any African-American is, you like the whites more than you like your own grandma. Because grandma was kind of sacred. So aping, to use that very unattractive language, the white style was something that came very comfortably into African American life in this equestrian thing. But it's also part of that whole, you know, power trip that the owner who had this painted is happy to show you. And here are the silks of this family. This is trifle, I think. Beautiful horse. I am not a horse person, but oh, this is tobacconist. And it's this is the title of the painting. Tobacconist with bots manual and bots ben and this is bots ben i believe they belong to the owner all of them kind of on the same level and again just this is richard singleton that's the horse he's got two names with viley's harry charles and lou so again the the documentation of the importance of African Americans in this equestrian aristocracy of the American South, 1834, so it was well before the Civil War and well before I think the South realizes that its aristocratic days are numbered. And a very sober face, all right, we're gonna keep going. Oh, this is Tenbrook. I thought you might just wanna see a picture of him. He was a real character. So kind of kind of interesting. Not very revealing picture, so I'm not going to spend time on it, but here it is. And this one I think is really interesting. This is a, a portrait by William Henry Brown of a woman named Sarah Pierce Vick, 1843. Brown's white, as are all these painters. He also had been a Philadelphian, and he became a painter and something else that I will say in a minute, but let me just look at this. I mean, chin up, madam. Riding crop, ready to do whatever needs to be done to horse or human. And her horse's caretaker here is clearly not at the status of a trainer, the way we saw the top-hatted frock coat guy. He is wearing an apron and holding a feed bucket and looking straight into the eyes of that horse. It's one of the things I liked about it. I mean, she is clearly in charge here. Even a woman is clearly in charge of this muscular African-American slave. But the man and the horse are looking right into each other's eyes, and that was, to me, reminiscent of the book. Uh, it's kind of sad and kind of wonderful at the same time. I put this in here only for those of you who are thinking ahead to contemporary art. That same guy, Brown, was a silhouettist. Silhouette cutting in this time period was a very popular art form. And who knows why, I don't. It, I don't know why it became popular. But in contemporary art, you can look up the name of Kara Walker. She is somewhere on one of these sheets. And she returns to this popular silhouette cutting to show the abusive relationships that were pervasive 
in the American South and other places as well. Be warned, uh, Carol Walker's stuff is nothing if not explicit. Explicit silhouettes. But there's a long history of that in the South and in England, this use of a silhouette to convey something. So same guy who did Sarah Vick did the silhouette. Now, this is an interesting one. This is a guy named Parson Dick. We actually have his name, also painted by Troy in 1843. He was a slave. And again, not quite sure uh, why he got painted. He was in Baltimore, and all Troy's other paintings have white sitters, but this one, he actually painted, so it's possible, who knows, maybe even a congregation said, we need a picture of this guy. I don't know why. And he's painted with some dignity and no background whatsoever. Kind of an interesting switch, but well-dressed, well-kempt. So in these paintings, and we'll get on to it, there's a complex world that we just touch of athletes, and entertainment, and social class, and racism, which becomes the marker for class in our democracy. We don't have a class, so then we need somebody at the bottom. So. And we see the limits of how African Americans are perceived. There are some serious paintings, but in those paintings, the African Americans are always performing at the command of others even when they're skillful. And their work is almost always non-productive, connected to leisure in terms of the horse racing and gambling for a community that they can never enter. They can never reap the rewards of that. And I think we saw that in the book too. Every once in a while, the exception proved the rule. Now, there's also non-equestrian antebellum paintings, and I think they're actually a little more interesting. Um, so that's where we're headed. This is called, I forget which one. Oh, this is Rustic Ball After a Sleigh Ride. And this is for whites. It's painted by a white guy, William Sidney Mount in 1839. And you can see that Mount is careful to show us that everybody was out in the cold and still has red cheeks. But this is a role that African Americans were allowed to take. They could entertain you. So they could, they could do all manner of things for the entertainment of white folk, right? Whether it was horses or fiddling, because they've got rhythm, right? I mean, some of this stuff came right into our own time. Natural disposition toward dance and musicality and movement and a beat. And so we understand that is down here, whereas the reasoned approach, the control of impulse, the decision about moving is reserved for the white class. So eventually we get white men, white men can't jump, right? But who cares? White men can sit very comfortably at a conference table and sign documents and make a lot of money. So this is an early illustration of that, and I won't uh, belabor it, but you can see that Mount is very careful to give us the whites of the eyes, the big red lips, the dark thing. And there's another guy out there at the door. He's got a, a crop like Sarah Vick had, right? So he probably was the driver of the sleigh. These are trusted people, but they're always on the outside. And here's a guy with some kind of bellows who's probably making sure that the fire keeps going and people stay warm enough to dance. But all three African Americans in this picture are out on the very edges of the picture, and they all have roles of caring for whites. And I'm sure that doesn't surprise you. This one is Kitchen Ball at White Sulphur Springs, 1838, also in the South. And once again, we have now a few more African Americans entering in and even dancing. So this is really important. They're shown, but it's voyeuristic. This is a kitchen ball. They're not going up to the big house for dancing and engaging with each other. 
They're dressed well, but they are limited to being in the kitchen for this event. And this is our fiddler, or one of them at least. So this is, this is looking into the lives of African Americans and showing them as happy in their limited location. And this one is a really, I think this is a hard one, Eastman Johnson, Negro Life in the South, 1859. And this was set in Washington, D.C., um, where there was a great debate about whether or not to abolish slavery in the capital. There's one white person in this painting. She's not. It's this woman who here is the one who's on the edge, right? She doesn't belong. She's looking in to the painting. And the relationships in the painting are really not, uh, not bad. We have a banjo player almost always. This is what William Henry Tanner is going to, uh, William Masala Tanner is going to pick up. But he's just not looking at anybody. So this is not educated music. This is important. This is that natural rhythm, what a person can do. This isn't, I've got, I've got a piece of music here by Ludwig van Beethoven. I don't think he wrote for the banjo, but forgive me on that. And, uh, and so he just drifts into his music. It's not learned because he probably couldn't. Kid's the only one watching. These people are all going about their business. I'm sorry for the pixelation, but I don't, it's pretty hard. The other thing that's important about this is even though they are shown here, like the people at the kitchen ball in the painting before, as kind of contented, it's a mess, isn't it? It's just a mess left to themselves. The African-American world is disorder. There's just stuff around. Decay, you can see that this is not long for its present position. There's a board propped up against the wall of the nearby house. The roof is covered with moss or lichens or whatever that stuff is. It is shown as Another one of this is their location, and when they're all together, this is what they're like. They can't really maintain, think into the future, learn in the same way that white people do. It's really quite a, quite a sad commentary. Now, we could look at this and say, oh, look what they're consigned to. Look what the results of slavery are. And that would not be an unfair way to read this painting. But it also, also comes into a world where people didn't read nearly as much as we do. And they would see a picture. And they would think, well, why don't they clean off the roof? That's what my dad would have said. Why don't they just put a few nails in that board? Huh? Yeah. Get up off his seat and stop playing the banjo and do a little work. Jill. Okay, thank you. Okay, and this is an itinerant fiddler. And this one I brought, not because uh, it's wildly different, but it, it's interesting. 1866. And this guy is itinerant. He'll come with his fiddle and in exchange for whatever, I don't know, a meal, some coin, probably a meal, he'll play for the family. And it's a white family who has the means to feed him. And once again, shown in that role of being an entertainer. And I ask you to continue to think about that as you go forward. Entertainers, athletes. OK. I watched one and a half football games yesterday. It's educational. And this one is by Winslow Homer. Oh, I'm going to have to go fast. Winslow, and if you have to leave, you have to leave. Winslow Homer, we think, is a little more sympathetic to African Americans. But this is called A Visit from the Old Mistress. And as I look at this, honestly, friends, it looks to me like that gap between the mistress and the former slaves. 
is almost a character in its own right. That big reddish door that goes up there. It's like, what is this? Is this gap bridgeable? She certainly is not making any move forward, right? And to be fair, how do you do that? How do you change your relationship that much? They aren't either. They're pretty, I think this uh, tallest African American woman looks pretty darn suspicious. And there she is dressed in pretty tattered clothing, but now trying to think, how do I claim freedom? What does that mean? Do I, am I allowed to care for her? Can we relate as humans? And there's that red door in the middle and we don't know the answer. And this also is by Winslow Homer, I am sorry to say. A lithograph, it's called Our Jolly Cook. And there you have it again. The white men sit around, this is 1863, I think, and in the middle of the Civil War, these are soldiers who are being entertained by a cook. I mean, it, it, everything kind of holds together still, doesn't it? This is what you're what you're allowed to be and so foolish that in the middle of a war he is jolly at least as his white painter names him and look at the stern soldiers in their positions with their arms their musket and this guy looks like he might be enjoying it a little bit but the mouth, the face, it's right out of Camper's manual that we saw with the orangutan. And then this clumsy looking uh, body with the legs going right out of minstrelsy. Our jolly cook. And here's that emancipation statue that I wanted to be sure to put in front of you. I think I'm going to be able to get to a little bit of African-American self-representation, but this ain't it. This is Thomas Ball, 1879, and I just want to point out the contrasts here. Abraham Lincoln is clothed. He is standing erect, and he has a name. The slave, half naked, back to that little slave from the 14th century of the king. He's crouched, back to that little slave from the 14th century. And he is unnamed. He is looking up. We somehow, and now this is elevated here, right? So it's hard to see if it were on the ground. But we look down at him with Lincoln. It's almost like blessing him. It is such a statement of white power and white personhood, even though it intends to celebrate emancipation, that you can hardly stand it. Because what's going on also, and these are two different ways, the humble African being freed, and then this is an original Jim Crow pamphlet. Now, this is pre-Civil War. I'm just putting it up here to show you the legs going again, the clumsy body, but also because it's the beginning of a long tradition of minstrelsy. African Americans as entertaining, and they're entertaining for a whole raft of reasons, which we don't have time to go into. We, it would be a subject in its own right. But African Americans themselves, and then white folk later, put on blackface to act goofy, in a word, to, to sing, to dance, to be laughed at. It's a clown costume, except that it's a racist clown costume. And it's funny because it's them, not us. This isn't how you're gonna grow up to be. This is what they can expect to grow up to be insofar as they grow up. And again, you get those same red lips, the big whites of the eyes, the exaggeration. The minstrelsy stuff took hold far and wide in the United States from about the 1830s on, and it was really popular in New York. They also imitated uh, dialect, 
made up by white folk, of these African Americans. And then some of you know Mr. Interlocutor, who comes along, who's dressed in that elegant way that we saw in the equestrian portraits, the formal white way, and he tries to be a formal white man, but Mr. Interlocutor trips over his own big vocabulary that he's try, he try to imitate white ways and can't do it, and that's funny too. So this is Comedy Central for the 1830s way on. Betty McIver breaks some of those stereotypes, and I am going to fly through these and show you her stuff. But um, when I was growing up, uh, we had Pancake Tuesday before Lent. It was a big deal at my German Lutheran church, Fasnacht. It was donuts, but we did pancakes. Don't ask me. And I remember that the men of the church would do a minstrel show with blackface. And friends, I don't go back to the Civil War. I'm starting to feel my age, but it isn't that far back. They, and it was, I didn't get it. You know, I was a little kid. I'm sitting there watching my father in blackface, trying to be funny. Neither one worked very well. And that was in Pennsylvania. I, I mean, this has a long history. I had a picture, maybe I took it out, of, yeah, I did, of uh, Ralph Northam in the 1980s. You remember the governor of Virginia? They discovered that he had participated in a minstrel show in blackface, and, and it was in his yearbook. And, that was not good for him. All right, this is the way, after, after the Civil War, the representation of African Americans by others was super negative. I'm just gonna, it got really virulent. And these are in widespread magazines and journals. It, it covers the United States. All right, and they show African Americans as just foolish just hopelessly foolish. Now he has a wife, he has a house, it doesn't look horribly dirty, it's not quite as bad as that one we just saw, but look at all the kids. And this is their Christmas turkey that he won. You see it here, barely, right? And the, the subset on that is, de breed am small, but de flavor am delicious in dialect, one at a turkey raffle, 1874, in Harper's Weekly. If that's not a caricature and cruel, I don't know what is. But again, serves to keep people's sense of what African Americans are capable of, as does this. These are Courier and Ives prints that were in the 1880s and on and on and wildly popular and in their big display window in New York City back in the day. Darktown against Blackville, football match. Look at the legs. They don't have control. You can hardly tell whose legs are whose here and the patched pants and right on the butt and of course that's the thing that you're in, and the shoes flying off, and the faces, oh, and the mouth, it's total caricature. They can't play white man's games. Maybe they can do their horses. And this one from that same series, this is the Dark Town Yacht Club, all designed to say when African Americans try to uh, do the elite thing, the aristocratic thing, they're comical. It's just so out of there, out of their kind. You'll just ballast the boat, Miss Tiny. And then there is a picture, I didn't put it in, of the boat capsizing and all these guys flying out with their legs flying again. But Miss Tiny clearly is not. And it's a mockery of African American women and men. Just a brutal portrayal. And this is another one that is about government that uh, colored rule in a reconstructed state. The poor white man sits at his desk with his papers just, oh, what can I ever do with these guys? And look at the size of their mouths. It just, it's just awful. 
So the goddess of peace is up there, but she's not having much luck. And the water mountain, I, somebody, I think it might have been Kara Walker, was told by her mother, you will never eat watermelon in public. Because of this caricature, I'm very busy just now, 1909. I'm very busy. 